Hello and welcome everyone to the second webinar of the Youth for Digital Sustainability program. Today our topic as you can see is fair digital businesses and we want to dive into ideas and approaches on how to create the digital transformation in a way that is profitable but also at the same time environmentally and socially beneficial and maybe we can also rethink tr traditional structure structures of who does business how and where because when i searched for this background uh, picture today when i searched for business uh, the internet su suggested to me that business looks like a white man in a suit and hopefully we can challenge that notion a bit as well in the next 60 minutes um, i may quickly introduce myself my name is elisabeth schauermann I'm a, I'm a policy officer at the German Informatics Society based in Berlin and I coordinate the Youth for Digital Sustainability project, which is, so to speak, a follow-up project to the 2019 Global Youth Internet Governance Forum Summit, which we organized and hosted as a, a host country initiative to the 2019 UN Internet Governance Forum, which took place here in Berlin. Last year, over 100 young people from all uh, parts of the world and all backgrounds came together in a longer period of time and then also physically in Berlin to create the youth messages, which was a set of recommendations. And in that we saw that sustainability is a huge issue and that especially young people care loads about different aspects of sustainability, which is why this year we focus on this and have elected this topic to be our main focus uh, in 2020. This year we are going fully virtual as many others do as well, um, also due to the current circumstances. However, to us this is not a huge problem, it's rather uh, a given because we work globally. Um, we connect in this project 53 young experts from all world regions, um, from 32 different countries specifically in a decentralized policy process. And there are four working groups in where each of those focuses on one aspect of digital sustainability. <laughs> Understanding. There seems to be feedback from one of my working group members. I will quickly mute you <laughs> and uh, so that we don't have that background noise. Um, so where was I? Right, the four working groups. Each working group uh, focuses, is, focuses on one uh, aspect of digital sustainability. The working group data can partly see uh, and will also hear later is the one focusing on economic sustainability. And what we want to achieve is a deliberative policy process spanning over several months, um, at the end of which we want to go out to the world with messages and recommendations towards the United Nations Internet Governance Forum. Um, and these webinars are uh, an opportunity for us not only to present who we are and what uh, the experts in this group are doing, but also to get your inputs. So the, the participants, you listening today, please use the opportunity to give us your questions and written statements. Um, maybe we cannot address all of those now in those 60 minutes, but we will certainly work on your, um, on your considerations later in the process and the working group will take them into consideration. All right. Here you can see almost all of the 53 young people. You can see um, we are quite diverse in, in what we are doing. And um, I'm super excited by all of these people because the level and the diversity of expertise that they bring in um, really helps in creating a holistic approach and a sustainable project. Um, so, as I said, we are very dependent also on your inputs because we don't want to work in silos. We really want to be very open in this approach. So, let the people know what you think. Um, so, the four key themes, as I briefly mentioned before, 
um, are greening the internet, which we had the webinar on last week. You can rewatch the recording on our website, or at least it's linked there. Today we are talking about fair digital businesses, so the economic aspects of digital sustainability. Then next week we are going to have a webinar on internet for social cohesion, so where we'll, we will focus more on how societies and, and people uh, come together on and through the internet and the positive and also positive impacts and also challenges that that can pose. And then on September 14th, the working group on sustainable internet governance is going to uh, give you an insight into the procedural and uh, structural questions that come with um, internet governance and how to progress on that. As I just said, and as you can see here, we have a website where you can learn more about the program. And if you want to be up to date always and also see all of the working group members introduced, uh, we have a Twitter account as well, which you can reach at Youth IGF Summit. All right. But with that, I can uh, now finally introduce you to the um, working group Fair Digital Businesses. You can see their faces here. Um, and up from top, it, it is Adishina, Daria, Elno, Folashade, Marcel, Mayova, Atif, Nurhan, Valerie, Juliana, Rashi, and Tatiana, and Effie, uh, who are the ones who are selected to be in this group based on their motivation and their expertise. And on the bottom right corner, you see uh, Christoph, who, is, who joins us as our guest expert today and who will also give the first input in his role as um, Corporate Responsibility Manager at IFA Social and Green IT. He has 10 years of experience in sustainability and he believes in the power of collaboration and the circular economic uh, economy. And yeah, Christoph, over to you. I will give you the right to share your screen yourself and you have the next minutes to yourself to give us an insight into your work and um, what you find most important in the topic of digital sustainability. Yes, um, thank you for having me here and for the opportunity to speak at first. Thank you for this honor. Um, yeah, now I will start sharing my screen. Uh, one second. Um, and yes, um, our main topic is circular economy and yes, as you know, everyone has computers, smartphones, notebooks and so on. It's standard today and it gives us uh, rapidly chances and opportunities in business and society, but we have also to take a wider view on this issue because IT devices can have also negative impacts and I also want to show you how and why and so my first question to you i know it's not possible to answer me directly but maybe you can just answer for yourself um my first question is um so i guess everyone owns a cell phone but my question is does have you maybe a second one or even a third one um it's not so uncommon because in germany uh we have around 200 million smartphones in our drawers hidden. So um, it's a huge amount of resources which are not a part of our economy. They are not part of the circular economy anymore. So uh, in former times, people have, people have collected stamps, now are collecting smartphones, interesting uh, development. And my second question is to you, or the next question is, have you ever uh, repaired your broken phone or have you ever um, bought a broken phone or repaired phone or even bought a modular smartphone so because um, around the world each year 1.4 billion smartphones are sold and normally every time uh, new resources are needed and uh, at the end they will end on landfill so so this is just a short insight in our topic um, to, um, because um, there are studies out there uh, from circularity gap. Um, they are 
um, explaining that the whole business around the world, if we all sum up, only 8.6% of all processes are circular currently. So the smartphone was just a, super, uh, a short example, but every, every process currently is based on the principle take, make, waste. And the problem is if we um, want to tackle our, uh, no, I can't see the screen myself, but it's okay. Uh, if you want to tackle the climate change, um, we see that nearly is, or that above 60% of all greenhouse gas emissions could be avoided if we can transform our uh, way of business our yes uh, into a circular business and um, so this is a nice leverage and this is a field where we are working in and another important um, uh, information is up from the study that the trend is negative. So we don't have a we don't have a positive development. We have a negative development that the status quo making this business is increasing and the circular business is losing. So that, so two years ago uh, we had above nine percent of circularity and now it's under nine percent. Yes. So just to give you an insight and now it's a question. Okay, what happened to all the stuff? when it's not a part of a circularity process. Um, so sorry, this is in German, the slide, but it's just focus onto the graphic. So we see the Western countries, Europe and the United States and Australia. And so, and they have the color Turkey, so green, and they are exporting the waste and e-waste to the global south. Even if we have strict rules in Europe, we have a lot of illegal, shipping of e-waste and um, yes so this is the current situation and um, so sorry again it's all <laughs> I hope this is the last picture in German um, it's about that we have over 50 million tons of e-waste each year and the picture you can see here is Akbubloshi in Accra which is the most uh, yeah, famous um, uh, uh, e-waste deponie in the world and yes and uh, yeah, this is yeah a bad development what we see here and um sorry my notebooks want to have to want to reboot no and i give you some figures so only 80 percent of global e-waste is not is is oh or 80 percent of the global e-waste is collected and recycled correctly. Yeah, not correctly, sorry, only 20% is collected correctly and recycled. 80% are going to landfill. And if we then go to the category of computers, monitor smartphones, so nearly half of this complete amount of e-waste is uh, computers and smartphones. And um, so we see a high leverage also here to, to make this sector more circular. And then, because we are focused uh, on B2B business, so we don't deal with direct customers or with, with, with private customers, more with, with um, business customers. So we know that only 25% of all companies um, are, have a process where they recycle their decommissioned IT correctly. One reason is, for instance, they are afraid of uh, data issues. You know, you have um, personal data and they believe it's better to shred everything, to destroy everything instead of deleting and reusing it. And if we don't do anything else, then in 2050, there are, there's, a statistic, there's a statistic that maybe the e-waste could double up. So I think there are enough reasons to do something. And because we are not only a normal business, we are also a social company or a non-profit company. So we want to tackle not only ecological issues, also social issues. Um, and because our headquarters is based in Germany, uh, I have brought you some figures from here. So um, around about between nine and 10% of our population has uh, disabilities. And um, um, so, uh, so it's around about eight 
million people and the most disabilities are due illness or to accidents and not by birth. So um, this is another um, yeah, problem we are tackling. And now I will tell you what we are doing exactly. So you can see, maybe you know the three columns of sustainability. So what we are doing is, um, uh, I can't move this here, okay. Um, what we are doing is um, we refurbishing we are refurbishing IT equipment, um, then we create jobs for disabled people. And so we can, through our business, we can protect the environment. This is a basic idea, but our core, our core mission is um, that we, um, sorry, um, sorry, <laughs> my wife needs, needs the keys to enter the house. <laughs> um, so the core mission is that we want to create as many jobs as possible for disabled people on the on the main uh, labor market. This is our basic idea of our company. Um, and we believe if you create the right working environment and working conditions, everyone is able to um, to work successfully. Uh, and yes, this is what we're doing. And so you can see here now our process. So on the left hand, you, you see the bigger circle. This is a, we call reuse circle. This is our main business. So we have around 700 partners now across five countries in Europe. And we are collecting the decommissioned IT hardware from companies or from the public sector. We bring it back to so the next location, so we don't transport it across Europe. We, you know, stuff from France stays in France and uh, also in Germany. And then we label it with a QR code, so you have a full traceability. And we delete the data professionally and certified. Then we're refurbishing the, the different uh, devices. And at the end, um, we sell them. We have our own stores we are selling it and of course online shop and other platforms. So this is our main business and but we cannot reuse everything you know something is too old, some something is damaged. So we prepare it for um, recycling. So sometimes if we are not able to delete all data correctly then of course we have to shred it because the data protection laws relatively strict in Germany and Europe, and that, but we, we we prepare for dismantling, and then we um, bring it to recyclers, but only in Europe because we want to avoid e-waste export. Uh, yes, that's the basic idea, and this is what it looks like. So on the left hand, this is our main business. So uh, two of three devices we are processing, we are able to refurbish and resell it again so we, we can say we can double up the lifetime of such products and one third is for recycling and and also for um, spare parts that we can use as spare parts right and of course we have a kind of impact measurement so i just go quick through it because maybe it's too many figures um so these are the figures from the last year so we have a process more than 475,000 devices um, and yes we are also cooperating with schools and other nonprofits. and you can hear you can see here our savings in uh, materials or resources and energy and of course in carbon emissions so for instance last year we were able to save 7, uh, 17,000 tons of uh, co2 and of course we give those figures to our partners so every year they get a kind of certificate where they can see how many jobs um, have been created through this cooperation um, um, and they get also uh, ecological figures where they can see how many resources and carbon emissions could be um, have been saved through this cooperation and they can also see their own refurbishing quote. So if you were able to refurbish 50 or 60 or 80% of their devices. 
and of course we want to um, make society but also companies aware of this so we have the certification certification would we give them and we also support the sustainability reporting so uh, we support some standards but we also have a kind of partner communication where we talk about this what we are doing so this is what we are doing now we know that this is not the final solution to solve this problem perfectly but this we are cooperating also with universities and institutes. This is the best what you can do today. But therefore, we are also are in touch with uh, some researchers. And um, this is what more like is an outlook. And this is uh, this one. I think you maybe you have heard about Fairphone, which is from Netherlands. This is a shift phone, which is uh, a German company. So I think it's important to I mean, I have uh, given you the numbers, you know, 1.4 billion smartphones are sold every every year. So I think we need more companies like Fairphone or no Shift Phone who have a different approach. And yes, nowadays it seems a little bit similar. So they are also focusing on modularity. Uh, and so the question here is how could a modular design increase the product lifetime of a smartphone? And so I just, it's, I think it's nearly my last slide now. Um, so the name of the project is Product Circularity Through Modular Design Strategies for a Long-Lasting Smartphone. And so we are in cooperation here with the Fraunhofer Institute and, uh, and it's funded by the Federal Ministry of Education and Research Germany. And so I want to find out what you can do in the future. We think that uh, modular smartphones have the potential um, to reflect the technical progress through upgrades. So that you don't need to replace a smartphone every second year, what, which is happening in Germany. So even there are different statistics, but yeah, I think nearly every second year um, people are changing the smartphone. And so it, through modularity, it could be an answer. So we want to try to find out. And um, so we want to examine the technical, the social and the uh, economic conditions for modularity. We want to identify the ecological benefits, but also the disadvantage maybe. Maybe it's, 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 uh, we, uh, we need to know if it's really better for environment or not. So therefore we will, or maybe, or as a partner of Fraunhofer Institute, we'll do a life cycle assessment of this product. Then of course, we want to analyze the human technology um, interactions. So we want to avoid that this smartphone is becoming a phone for nerds. It's important that this is uh, something for the, for the mass market. And so this is also part of the project. Um, and of course, we will uh, have a closer look to the business model because in Europe it's pretty common if you have a contract with a telecommunic telecommunication company you get every so after two years you get a new phone and I think this is not a business model for the future because it's wasting resources and it's hardly understandable because you don't have this high jumps in technologies now and, and most of us just chat and whatsapp or, or what else but so the question is why do you need the best super smartphone or maybe um yeah so that we can reduce this changing of models and of course yes we want to analyze the repairability or also if it's easier to recycle so we are part of this project and this project is running now for for another two years and at the end yes we can give you maybe some Final results. So, you, if you like, but unfortunately, the website is only in German. I'm sorry. Uh, but on the web, on the project website, there are more information about this uh, research project. Okay. So that's it. This was my quick uh, insight into um, our business and about the future, maybe. So now I will cancel this sh sharing and we'll bring it back to Elizabeth. Thank you, Christoph. Um... This was a very interesting insight into uh, a case of a company that 
really takes different aspects of, of sustainability into account and to heart. And um, Christoph, I would like to get back to you later when we have heard the inputs from the from our working group. And I'm sure that there are a few questions or statements that have come up in response to what you just told us. But I would now um, like to give the floor to Fola Schade, who is um, part of the working group Fair Digital Businesses. And she's going to, in the next four to five minutes, give us a brief insight into her work that she does with WTEC, uh, in which she empowers women in STEM in Nigeria. For the the floor is yours. You can unmute yourself and turn on your camera. There you are. Floor is It seems that we cannot hear you yet. All right, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, can you hear now. me now? Yes. All right, thank you so much. Can you please show my slide? Okay, so while you do that, um, so good to be here. Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Folasha De Braimo. I work as programs manager for uh, a Nigerian nonprofit organization. We are committed to building a more inclusive technology ecosystem with the next generation of women technology creators, entrepreneurs, and leaders. The name of the organization is the Women's Technology Empowerment Center, or WTEC Project. All right, um, as I rightly mentioned, our greater goal is to bridge the gender gap in technology use, employment, and innovation. So one of the ways we do this is we build technology skills of women. We also connect women with development opportunities. A lot of research has shown that um, a lot of um, some of this problem are stereotypes, lack of female role models, um, lack of information, and also few women working in the STEM field. So this problem has really um, caused a lot of young girls or ladies and really discouraged them from pursuing or even going into a career or um, entrepreneurial skills. So we have put together some programs in order to encourage these girls and also boost their morale in terms of um, technology. So I'll be sharing some of these programs with you in a few minutes. One of it, as you can see on my screen, is the She Create Camp. The She Create Camp is a residential program for girls aged 13 to 17 years. We help them to develop their technology skills. We bring them together to a boarding school facility and we teach them a lot of technology programs such as robotics, uh, mobile apps, websites, and the likes of it. Another program I would like to share with us is the Dobitech Academy. This is an after-school technology program for girls in public secondary school, mostly from underserved communities, and it is designed to inspire these girls to pursue computer science careers. Another program I would like to share with us is the Maker Space. I don't know if some of us are familiar with the maker space. A maker space is somewhere that um, people can generally come together to create things and work around just coming out with a result. Okay, for us, we um, decided to come up with a maker space for technology, just for girls and ladies. Okay, so this initiative um, is mostly for girls and ladies the served communities, mostly rural communities in Nigeria. That is where we are trying to hold this program. And it is an initiative that teaches young women to create technology and engineering-based solution to solve problems in their communities. We want to boost their moral, we want to build, build their um, skills in this science and technology field. Another interesting um, program that we run is the Shikan with ICT. It's an acronym for um, Sustaining Our Enterprise Career and Network with ICT. This program focuses on increasing the number and viability of female-owned technology businesses by equipping more women entrepreneurs to use technology strategically to level economic opportunities for their businesses. So all of these programs that we do, we do them through a mix of technology classes, workshop, presentation, excursion, leadership, exercise. Um, we connect some of these ladies and young women 
um, with mentors that are in line with the career that they want to pursue in future or whatever entrepreneurial skill that they want to build up. So we endeavor to build strong women, intelligent women and focused young women that might be able to work and increase the number of women in technology. Okay, so over the years, um, we are 13 years this year and over the years, um, our beneficiaries are 31,651 young women and girls. Okay, and amongst these people, 86.21% um, of them have been inspired to pursue careers in STEM, that is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. 24.14 of them are studying or have completed a STEM degree. And the rest of um, the 51.47 of them are using technology skills and knowledge to earn income for themselves. So this has been very interesting for us. And um, when we see this result, we are really happy and um, we are really excited that we're able to help these young women with great potentials and skills that have been so shy um, in using technology or even coming out to show that they are good um, in terms of technology. Um, so that's that's the thing that that's what we've been doing for the past 13 years and it's really been interesting for us okay so um i would like to end on this notes i would like to end with the unesco's 2017 cracking the code reports that explains as 10 underpins the 2030 agenda for sustainable development and leaving out girls and women and other marginalized group from STEM, education, and career is a loss for all societies. So I urge us all to please, in every way we might be able to do this, try as much as possible to help every girl around you, every woman around you that you feel that is shy or feels that she's less of herself or feels that she can't do it. Help them to show that they can do it. And um, thank you very much for listening and being part of this. God bless you. Thank you, Polashada. Uh, your work is actually also close to what we are doing here at the German Informatics Society, in which we want to like engage people, young people, women, into ICT and uh, computer sciences. This obviously has a strong economic aspect, right? Uh, there's so much lost if we don't um, have the people participate who make up a big part of, of our society. So thank you, Palajada, for your input. Um, I would like to now go on uh, with the next short insight. Five minutes uh, also uh, will be now occupied by Adeshina, who is one of the founders of One Kiosk Africa. Adeshina, you can now uh, hopefully give us an, an insight into what you're doing and what you want to achieve and how this relates to the to sustainable development and uh, digital sustainability. The floor is yours for the next five minutes. If you go over, I will turn on my camera and that is your clue that you should uh, wrap it up. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Thank you everyone that is joining in to this section. Uh, basically, you know, Boston Consulting Group you know, as anticipated, that e-commerce has the potential to create 3 million new jobs in Africa, you know, over the next, uh, you know, five years, you know, meaning that by 2025, we can achieve 3 million new jobs. You know, looking at this slide here, you can see, you know, this, you know, beautiful woman, hardworking, you know, she's a replica of, you know, the Nigerian African woman. Very, very, you know, uh, consistent, very hardworking. They wake up early, they go to the market, and they actually account for, you know, the vast majority of those who actually create employment, you know, within the value chain across Nigeria, both in the agricultural space, both in the retail space. But this set of guys, this set of women, whom I try to tag as Mama Nkechi, you know, have been left, you know, with the, you know, the, the struggle to actually connect to market and also to finance. Now, in 2018, you know, uh, my wife, you know, was here and um, somehow I, I struggled, you know, to connect, you know, with, you know, my daily essentials to buy what I needed. 
and we have a growing population of over 500 million you know growing youth especially within the age of 18 to 45 you know who are also eager to make sure that they're able to get whatever they need to buy within a timely manner however if we do not connect them timely you know they won't you know be able to shop so what we at one Kiosk africa decided to do is to support people like mama and Kechi, as you can see you know on the screen you know to actually connect to this you know huge population thereby helping them to solve this issue of access to market the question is how do we make mama and Kechi connect to people around her who are looking for what she has you know from tomatoes to pepper to any other grocery or any other essential that they need in their house how do we connect them you know so what we do at one kiosk is to basically leverage on geolocation to give these guys access to market to timely connect you know them to customers around their locations who are looking for what they have in their shop therefore we provide the platform whereby they can manage their inventory upload what they have we also have you know a system whereby you know we train them you know to be able to bridge this digital you know literacy gap especially with the use of them being able you know to use smartphones so that they can manage their inventories and also connect you know to the wide market that exists you know in the online space according to the internet uh what start like i said we have over 500 million african you know africans connected to the internet and also across europe and us we have a growing population but the micro guys you know which were so called the mom and pop stores have been left out of this particular niche you know to be able to connect but this is not only what we do at one kiosk we also leverage on the data because we know that there are also a lot of you know small businesses that are struggling in locations that people don't actually have a need for what they actually sell so we leverage on this data to actually connect them to the right place where they need to set up their businesses. And we also leverage on their sales data to then connect them to partners who might be interested in funding them, you know, and financing them to be able to build capacity. Since we started Pilot, you know, uh, in July 2019, we've been able to, you know, uh, support over 14,000, you know, small businesses, just like Mama and Kechi, you know. And apart from that, you know, we've also been able to create direct jobs of over 200 guys, you know, who go out, you know, to onboard these guys and also pick up from people like Mama and Kechi and deliver it to people within their communities. Our goal basically at One Kiosk Africa is to revolutionize how buying and selling is done, but not just leaving it open, you know, to just the high class guys, but also carrying along, you know, Mama and Kechi in an inclusive commerce system that will actually bet job creation and also add to the economic viability of every market that we operate. We are very determined and we're passionate you know, to actually you know, solve these issues because if you look at Mama and Kechi and you know, those that actually are around our shoes, those are people that actually have family to cater for and they are actually eager you know, to add value to the economy. Join us in building a sustainable e-commerce model, even as we work towards, you know, creating one million jobs over the next five years. Thank you. Thank you, Adeshina. I think the um, your perspective on how to empower small business owners. I mean, you're working uh, in Nigeria and across Africa, but I think this is, uh, you know, an opportunity or an idea that you know can live in different um, contexts. So thank you for your input. I would. Now, I already like to move on uh, to Tatiana, who is also um, a part of the working group Fair Digital Businesses, and she is going to speak on her project Digital for Growth Bootcamp. Tatiana, the floor is yours. You can turn on your camera and mute yourself. Same goes for you. Five minutes when they're up, I will show you my face. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Elizabeth. I hope you can hear me. Uh, so hello everyone, I'm Tatiana Runjo from Republic of Benin. I'm joining you today from Abu Mekalavi, so good afternoon from Benin. I know uh, talking about digital businesses uh, includes so many aspects, but I'm going to focus more on the issue of education, especially the 21st century skills 
uh, and try to show the link uh, the link with the main topic of this webinar, which is fair digital business. So from my experience and from my experience here in Benin, most of the students uh, graduate without uh, a real idea of what the labor market look like. They they just come in and they cannot find a job because not only because they don't have uh, they don't, cannot access a job, but also because they cannot work in this job or also the work they are trained for or they are educated for uh, as this no more or has changed so you all can agree that the digital transformation is so obvious now so the question is how do we equip generation with the necessary skills uh, to take advantages of the new job opportunities to take the lead at this 21st century um, or to assess opportunities that result for this uh, digital transformation, we make sure that they can adapt uh, and, and shape themselves. So we cannot talk about fair digital uh, business or fair digital industries while people are naturally growing up using digital technologies and the others still struggling to, um, to assess it either due to lack of skills or bad internet quality or even internet shutdown. So we have a, a big issue of digital divide that needs to be addressed if we want to achieve a sustainable uh, uh, digital world. I mean, this is why we are here. <laughs> so these are the gap that the organization I, I work in, African Youth Empowerment for Future Initiative is, is, is trying to, to bridge. Currently, we, I mean, uh, some volunteers and I are working on Digital for Growth. It is a program of the organization I just mentioned, the African Youth Empowerment for Future Initiative, or IF Initiative. Uh, one of the core aspects of the Digital for Growth Bootcamp is to equip your internet users in Benin, uh, and also especially from Francophone Africa, with um, behavior skills to fully realize themselves and act responsibly on the internet, including social media and social media as well. To be specific, to be specific, uh, this project or this program will organize capacity building workshops on topics such as the best practices have on internet to be secure, to be safe uh, and to secure others also critical media literacy uh, creation of quality content and also how to use internet for for economic growth so this workshop will be after a global call for application and the participants will be selected based on their leadership skills and the capacity to share the their experiences and their learning with others and contribute to, to a better digital world. They, after this, um, I mean, after uh, the, the program, after being participant of the digital for growth bootcamp, they become directly ambassador, ambassadors who can promote this program and expand uh, its impact. So uh, earlier this year, uh, this program, this bootcamp has been selected um, as part of the community leaders for Internet Health Program, which is organized by Digital uh, Grassroots and Mozilla Foundation as key contributor for health. Uh, to finish, I want to, to say you that building a digital inclusive and sustainable community requires participation and support from all sectors. So yeah, this is what I have to say for now. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Tatiana, um, and thank you for this insight. I think, as you said, empowering people through outreach and workshops uh, and bringing them closer to, to the opportunities that there are in the digital world uh, is certainly a very important part. And thank you for doing this work. Um, with an eye on the time, I would now like to give the floor to Rashi, who will introduce her project that she's now uh, planning with the World Economic Forum. Rashi, 
floor is yours. Five minutes. Go ahead. Thanks, Elizabeth. Is it possible if I could also share my screen? Um, we are a bit late on time, so um, okay. I messaged you. Please do it without your slides. And uh, okay, I hope great. Go ahead. Works. Okay. Okay, perfect. I'm going to go ahead. Uh, so, hi, everyone. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I come from Bangalore, India, which uh, is a very promising land for the IT sector. And uh, my city is also known for, is one of the biggest markets probably in the world for refurbished items. Uh, I'm, I'm currently uh, doing three projects with the World Economic Forum. One is on sustainable fashion, where we're trying to build agency among 55 regions uh, across the world uh, on how to build uh, equity uh, from the uh, human rights aspect of the sustain of fashion and how the fast fashion industry is and also the climate change aspect of it. Uh, but I'm here to talk about the project that I am doing on uh, helping uh, how, how I can help the informal sector in India, uh, especially given the COVID crisis. And the COVID crisis is hasn't really been very, there's a huge digital divide in India, especially with the rural side and the urban side. And I think the people who have been affected the most are the women. And uh, my country also comprises uh, that 60% of the workforce is in the informal sector. And especially now when everyone's at home and uh, you have most of the people who are, most of the women who are working in the craft clusters don't have access uh, to be able to carry out their informal businesses. And this is through simple means because the quality of service is so low. Uh, you have through WhatsApp or through Facebook. So what uh, we were looking at is how uh, how can we how can we upskill these women uh, digitally, and how we can also uh, look at uh, helping women who are in and we also have a lot of factories that have been shut. I mean, just giving you the status quo of India, where we have uh, seventy five thousand cases, there is uh, there is and most of the, the the nature of employment in these factories is daily wage or piece rate workers. When I say piece rate workers, they are paid by the hour or they are paid by jobs. Um, and because of the global uh, halt in the supply chain, most of the uh, textile workers have um, have been unemployed for the last six to seven months. Uh, they don't have any sort of social security and there is no uh, sort of backup uh, given by factories because most of the global brands have also halted uh, the orders. Uh, so what can one really do uh, when we want to economically empower these women who have lost their jobs and who have nowhere to go and also uh, we also see that the working conditions for these women are also terrible uh, they are subjected to a lot of human rights violations uh, uh, gender based violence is a huge issue uh, so what we wanted to do was we wanted to uh, start a marketplace for these women uh, especially in e-commerce uh, where they would uh, we would raise funds uh, to give them refurbished devices it can be tablets or laptops uh, skill them and and help them uh, get on e-commerce. So we also have an issue of uh, a middleman uh, who takes the cut for most things. So uh, creating a decentralized marketplace for women to be able to sell uh, their craft products and uh, using uh, the World Economic Forum as a platform uh, would help uh, help them amplify their business and also keep them uh, economically sustainable. So yeah, I think that that's about it. I've kept it. I hope I haven't gone over time. Thanks, Elizabeth. You were right on time. Thank you, Rashi. And I think, um, I mean, from what I just heard, this is a very interesting case of how you look at a very like a, a problem that is regional or that is specific to your surroundings and bringing it to an international global level, um, which is great. Thank you for for the insights. Um, I would like to now open the floor to the rest of the working group and also to Christoph if you want to engage but first off um, Marcel who is also part of the Fair Digital Businesses group asked me to give him the floor to introduce the means to uh, engage every one of you so Marcel if that is still the case please go ahead unmute yourself show your face and let Hi. us know what you plan for us. Uh, thanks a lot, Elizabeth, for giving me the floor. Um, could you uh, share the link uh, that I provided you for the poll uh, through the chat to all of the participants? That would be great. 
Yes, um, give me a second. I don't have it at hand, but maybe <laughs> I'll search for it. I can provide that to you straight away. So uh, thanks everybody for uh, chiming in. Um, I wanted to introduce myself uh, pretty shortly. My name is Marcel Kermanauer, I'm from Germany. And uh, as Elizabeth already stated, uh, this whole thing is about a holistic uh, bottom-up approach. So we wanted to take the time to take your opinion and uh, want to gather some of your insights and not your opinions about fair digital business. Um, therefore, we've uh, provided a short questionnaire, which is going to be provided by Elizabeth in a second, um, where you can introduce um, the area or the aspect which is the most relevant for you within the topic of fair digital business at the moment, and we would highly appreciate um, if you could just take the minute and uh, provide that uh, and share that with us. And the, the second thing is, if you should be part of an engagement of uh, a program or a project which is dealing with a fair digital business, we would highly appreciate if you could share that through the chat, and we would be really happy to uh, reach out to you throughout the project throughout the next month and uh, considering your opinion um, within that um, project. So thanks everybody for, for listening and looking forward to hearing from you. Take care. Thank you, Marcel. I have now uh, posted the link to the chat so everyone who is with us could, should be able to uh, see that and click on that. And um, I'm amazed by the, this working group taking it into their hands to really get your insights and your opinions. So it would be highly appreciated if you could all leave a bit of feedback on, on this link. Um, so now the rest of the group, Daria, Ernur, Atif, Nuhan, Juliana, FB, is there anything that you want to point out, highlight, uh, any idea that you want to bring up? You can just take the floor by uh, turning on your camera and muting yourself and share with us. Yes, Valerie, hi. Is there anything you oh, want hi, to bring Elizabeth. up? Thank you so much. And uh, thank you everyone who's listening to us from every part of the world. My name is Valerie, I'm from Kenya. And just to sort of like, be very appreciative for Elizabeth and the team for creating this working group, just to also mention, as uh, my other colleagues had talked about, for instance, the one kiosk Africa and Rashi's idea on giving women skills to empower them into the e-commerce platform it would also be very important to talk about legislation in terms of the legislation that goes into digital businesses. Currently, we are having issues about digital service tax. We are having things like um, countries putting in um, marketplace taxes, for instance, in Kenya. So it would be very interesting to just go into the working group later and delve into these issues because whenever there's business and most of digital business, then comes the issue of digital taxes that may then hinder innovation or um, empower innovation. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Definitely. Um, I, as far as I know, a few of, of the working group uh, participants have a legal background, so we'll hopefully have an insightful discussion on, on how regulation plays into that uh, as well. Thank you. Anyone else who wants to speak up? Any questions that you could raise? Yes, Daria, go ahead. Um, I am in awe of all the projects that the working group members have been leading and conducting. And if anything, I just wanted to say how much I appreciate that this is a conversation that we're having. And yesterday we chatted a little bit as a group and I think what's important to recognize as well is the idea of fair businesses and sustainability, it intersects with so many different conversations and themes. And we've seen discussions around conservation. We've seen discussions on transparency, accountability, the concept of regulating artificial intelligence use, especially as it is replacing manual labor and more human interaction, and how do we understand the implications of those changes that we're creating. And I think it's difficult to narrow it down, but 
the more intersectionality we can bring to this conversation, the better. And that's partially why participation from the attendees is gonna be very helpful and we'll just continue to find ways to bring more equity to this conversation and privacy and security, fair competition from fair wages to benefits and just ensuring that everyone has the right access to the technology that we are creating and using for business transformation. Um, so we can scale that and continue this conversation. I think that would be incredible. Very much agreed, Daria. Thank you for your input. And I hope that with all the different uh, perspectives in the group and also, as you said, from external uh, voices, we can create something that takes as many perspectives into account as possible. Um, I've just heard from Juliana that she wants to speak next. Juliana, the floor is yours. There seems to be an issue with your... Um, camera but even if we can't see you uh, that shouldn't hold you back from speaking uh, we'll try and unmute you yeah great uh well hello everybody uh my name is juliana i'm from sao paulo brazil and uh, i'd like to talk a little bit about an initiative that has been going on in brazil for some months now uh and it started with the pandemic uh, just a disclaimer, I'm not directly involved with it. I'm just a great supporter. Uh, well, many people lost their jobs during the pandemic and started working for mobile apps focused on delivery services. However, the work conditions were really lacking in terms of revenue for the workers and also in terms of security and health conditions. Uh, most apps, for instance, did not provide workers with insurance in case of accidents or any kind of health support in case the workers got coronavirus or have the have any kind of health related needs so workers in delivery apps decided to found a movement called uh break of the apps in portuguese which i guess would be translated into something like the break of the apps in english and they asked the general population uh which means clients of those uh, delivery apps on social media to stop ordering food from them from one day in order to create pressure so that they could negotiate better work conditions uh, the break of the apps happened in some specific dates during the pandemic. So dates in which people would not, uh, deliver and, uh, ask for, for any food from those apps. And the good thing is that people actually supported it and stopped ordering food in those specific dates. Uh, the initiative is still happening, but I would say there are definitely good results. Uh, the company who owns the delivery apps have shown themselves open to negotiate the better conditions for these workers. And I think what's most interesting of all is that the general population really joined the movement and stopped ordering from the apps on the designated days, which I think shows that the struggle for fair digital businesses is not only a matter of those who are employers versus employees or autonomous workers, but really everybody that's making use of those services. I just wanted to share this as an interesting example of how everybody can contrib contribute to a fair digital environment, not only those who own the businesses or work for the businesses. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Juliana, and thank you for sharing with us, um, you know, different aspects of what you said ring very much true. You know, there's always, when we talk about business, there's also always the side of like the consumer who takes decisions or also businesses in a B2B context who take decisions on who to work with and uh, which policies to to include and then there's obviously the people who are working or who are empowering themselves or empower others to work under fair conditions and this is all amplified by our current uh, situation of the pandemic so thank you very much for sharing um, we are almost at the end of our hour and now i would like to bring it back as we were just talking about how employers and employees and and businesses uh, can act or if what shifts there that could be, I would like to bring it back to Christoph for one uh, last final statement. I would ask you to give us the honors uh, after what you've heard from the group um, to leave us with a bit of advice, maybe a tidbit, uh, an insight of what we should keep in mind going forward. Uh, what would you like to highlight for the working group when they work on their recommendations? Okay, hello again. 
Uh, yeah, <laughs> what a surprise. Um, no, I think we have enough highlights. I don't need to highlight anything else. Um, I heard a lot of interesting projects. And yes, I think at the end, collaboration is the key. If I think, if I go in my mind through all projects, it's all, even if it's digital, at the end, it's about humans. And, um, and it's not, today I think we have so complex issues you can only solve it together at the end, yes. This is my final conclusion. Thank you, Christoph. And um, with that, I would like to end today's webinar already. Thank you to the working group and thank you to you, Christoph, for um, sharing with us and, and bringing up ideas. The, the process now is the following, that the working group will take everything that was talked about into account. We will also uh, hand over your contributions that you made in the poll and in the questions here and um, then the working group will go into a retreat so to speak over a few weeks and uh, develop key ideas and messages that they want to then bring to the UN and other fora. Um, I would like to point you to next week Thursday same time we're going to talk about uh, the Internet for Social Good with the working group uh, co-creating in the same fashion as, um, as the working group on Fair Digital Businesses did today. We will be joined by a guest from the uh, Web Foundation to give us an insight into their work. And with that, I would like to leave you and uh, have a good day, everyone. Join us next week again and see you soon. Goodbye. Bye-bye.